Good morning. Will you please rise and join us for worship today? Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. You are speaking truth to power. You are laying down our swords, replanting every vineyard till a branch. Fullness 
Oh, what peace. 
please remain standing for prayer. Good morning, church. All our ways are indeed known to God. Um, Psalm 62, 8 says, Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Let's go to the God who is our refuge this day. God, we lift up our families before you as we work together, go to school, we play together, and all the things that we do, God, I pray for our safety and our protection. I pray that, God, that you continue to bind our families together and most of all, bind them closer to you in everything that we do. God, we want to lift up also our missionaries before you. We, we think of the Rempels, we think of um, that Gladys and Dominic Jacobs, we think of Susan Ling in Senegal and Sandra Chandradat. God, we pray that you will continue to intensify their love and their work for you. You will give them your strength and your power. God, and most of all, that the work that they do would bring much fruit and many people, God, would come into your kingdom as a result. We pray especially for Sandra as she seeks to go back to India. God, I pray that you would make the way smooth and clear for her to go as she awaits just a, a clear door as we wait on COVID to be a bit less, God. God, we can't forget our elderly who've been so faithful over the years. We think of uh, Faye Palafox and we think of Iris Holder. God, we think of Daphne Bean. I pray, God, that you would strengthen these women and there are some men out there, I'm sure, that as they seek you, as they continue to be faithful to you, you will strengthen them as well. You will let them know that you love them in a deep way and that we love them as well and that their God, their works are not in vain in whatever they do for you. God, we can't forget our church staff, the pastors, the deacons, the sextons, and everyone who's involved. We think of uh, the secretaries and the administrators and the Christian ed workers. God, we pray that you will indeed strengthen them as well, help them not to grow tired and weary in the work that they do as they prepare the church every week for the various activities that are going on. We continue to ask for your strength and your wisdom in all that they do. God, these men and women faithfully serve you. We ask you for, to bless them. And we pray for the church as a whole as the building project continues to go, that it would be smooth and the money would always be there, God, and the workers would be fine on the job. And I pray that you put your whole protection on this area of the church and on Flushing as a result of your people coming here each week and praying faithfully to you. We love you and we know that you protect us and that you are here, God. And we pray that we will continue to be faithful people to you. God, we also want to lift up our city. You know it's in such dire straits with the COVID disease and everything else that's going on. We lift up our mayor, we lift up the governor, God, and we pray that you'll give these men and their staff, as well as the city council, wisdom to lead the city in a, in a good spot, in a good way, God, for all the people of New York and that their God, they'll allow us to beat this COVID disease in any way that we can. But we also pray for the restaurant workers who can't work and who can't make money. God, provide for them in ways that we've not thought of. God, and lift, we lift them up to you that you would really just keep your peace in their hearts and keep their minds on you. And I pray that as the country goes through this disease, God, that many people's hearts would turn to you. They will seek you. God, be there for them and let them know that you are the God who's in control of everything. We think that we are in control, God, but we know that you ultimately are in control as you are indeed our refuge. And lastly, God, we lift up our federal government to you, the new administration under President Biden. I pray that you will give his entire cabinet and staff the wisdom and guidance to lead this country in the right way. God, I pray you continue to put people in place who love you and who fear you and want to do the right things in your eyes. We pray that you continue to keep America strong and that together with all the different cities and states, we can continue to fight this disease. God, again, we love you and I pray for Christians everywhere that you would strengthen us, our faith would be deepened, God, during this time and that, dear God, we will come out stronger in the end and we will continue to see your faithfulness. We ask you all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Today's uh, scriptures uh, reading is from Jonah 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. 
Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from the evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. This is the word of the Lord. D.L. Moody was probably one of the least likely candidates that the Lord would use to bring the gospel to the multitudes. Born in a family of nine children, uh, Moody's father died when Moody was only four years old, when D.L. Moody was 17. He went to work uh, for his uncle at his uncle's um, used, not used, uh, shoe, as, at a shoe store, as a shoe salesman. He's not buying used shoes. One of the stipulations was that he would go to uh, Sunday school, to church, and it was in that Sunday school where D.L. Moody came to know the Lord. Uh, his own Sunday school teacher had no idea the kind of impact that he would make for the kingdom. After all, he was just an uneducated shoe salesman. But then the Lord saw something that no one else saw, and Moody became one of the greatest evangelists that America had ever seen. Before um, Billy Graham, before Billy Sunday, there was D.L. Moody. As his ministry grew, D.L. Moody decided that he would cross the pond to the British Isles and uh, bring the message of the gospel to the English. In October of uh, 1882, Moody held an evangelistic meeting. Students from Cambridge University were among those in attendance. In those days, uh, England was a very classist society, and a person's accent would uh, place them within the hierarchy of that society. Now, we all know that Moody didn't come from a well-to-do family. He didn't have much of an education. And at this particular meeting, D.L. Moody was preaching from Daniel. And he himself couldn't pronounce the name Daniel. He would say, Daniel, Daniel. And when the uh, Cambridge students heard it, a couple of them could not help themselves but mock him. Now, as a quick side note, last week after I preached, someone uh, texted me and, and said that I sounded like Sylvester the cat when I said Tarshish. <laughs> now, Sylvester the cat is before my time, so I just took it as a compliment. It wasn't. When I YouTube Sylvester the cat, I was like, suffering succotash. <laughs> And in this instance, though, it was a joke. But in the case of D.L. Moody, it was vicious. They were full on heckling him, shaming him, the kind of way people do if you want to bury someone and make them get off the stage. But then the unexpected happens. D.L. Moody stops mid-sermon and looks those two right in the eyes. He confronts them. He said, quote, I may not have had much of an education, but I do have manners. And that's more than what can be said about you. It cuts them to the core. They actually sit still and listen. Surprisingly, for each of these two men, there's a change of heart within them. They recognize their need for Christ. They give their lives to the Lord. The Lord sets in them this fire that nothing could, could dampen. And these two students band together in what would later become known as the Cambridge Seven. With other like-minded Cambridge students, 
they devoted their lives to missions, joining the China Inland Mission, uh, Hudson Taylor's organization, and what is now OMF. And they play this integral role in ushering in the modern day missions movement. Their greatest contribution was their example, this fire that nothing could dampen. When people saw how these Cambridge grads were pretty much every door open to them, how they chose instead to serve the Lord, it opened up people's imaginations to ask the question, why not me? And as a result, many uh, gave their lives to serve the Lord. Now, if we were to look at this as a case study, if we were uh, to look at this as how God works, what would we see? I believe that we would all powerfully see uh, and agree how powerfully the Lord used an uneducated shoe salesman to reach the academic elite in England. God used D.L. Moody's hard words to convict and soften hearts. And I think the key to this was their genuine repentance that took place in each of their hearts that ultimately changed the course of their lives and brought revival to the lives of many others as their influence spread far and wide. Now today, as we look at Jonah chapter 3, we're going to look at what a revival looks like, how it happens, uh, what we can do to prepare for it. I want to explore how a community can catch fire. I will contend that the, the key actually lies in repentance. Now, before we turn to the text, let's all bow our heads as we turn to the Lord together. Our Father in heaven, we long for revival in our hearts and more importantly, revival in our land. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees, we ask that we would be instruments useful to you. Accomplish your purposes for our great city. In Jesus' name, amen. So a quick recap of uh, Jonah, courtesy of one of the guys in, uh, who sent me a, a summary from a Sunday school. It goes, uh, Jonah, God says, go to Nineveh. Jonah says, no. God appoints a big fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah's like, fine, I'll go. God appoints the big fish to spit Jonah out onto dry land. Now, that's a real Cliff Notes version. Some details may have been left out. But throughout this short series, what we've seen as we've looked through this narrative is we've seen this from the perspective of Jonah. Today, though, what's going to happen is we're going to zoom out. We're going to see the unfolding of the story, not only from Jonah's perspective, but more so from the point of view of the Ninevites as we see this revival break out in Nineveh. Read with me now in Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah chapter 3 begins with the Lord initiating conversation with Jonah again. God is in essence giving Jonah a second chance. And it really shows this uh, grace that God has for the rebellious prophet. God's command to Jonah this time is exactly the same as his command in chapter 1. He hasn't lowered his standards for obedience. His standards and purposes remain the same. Now, if you ever were to study the attributes of God, this is known as the immutability of God. It speaks to God's unchanging nature, his unchanging purposes for the nations. There's this consistency with God. Those of you who are children get really frustrated when parents tell you one thing on one day and then change their mind the next day. Same thing happens when your boss asks you to do something, but then completely changes the project after you've already started and put in work. We all value consistency. And with God, we can bank in his unchanging nature, in his unchanging purposes. Now, in this instance, the Lord has a plan for Nineveh. And it's his plan for revival in that great city. The text calls Nineveh the great city of Nineveh. Some translations use the word vast and exceedingly great. And it's all true because it was a massive city. It took three days to visit. But in the earlier version of the NIV, Nineveh in, in verse 3 was described as important. Nineveh was not just Nineveh. Nineveh was the important city of Nineveh. I really like that translation because it got at the heart of the meaning. Nineveh is great 
because it was important. It was important culturally, it was important because of his size, it was important because of his power, but most of all, Nineveh was important because Nineveh was important to God. Nineveh is great because uh, it mattered to God. God cared about his people. He wanted to initiate this work of revival there. So this leads us to our first point. Revival is always and only the work of God. Only God can bring revival. People cannot manufacture revivals any more than we can bring life to a person. God initiates, and it is God who makes revivals happen. I've said this before, but it's worth repeating. We can't make revivals happen. It's like in Mean Girls, where uh, one of the characters keeps trying to make fetch a thing, right? Gretchen, you can't make fetch happen. It's not going to happen. How? In the same way, we can't make revivals happen. However, even though we can't make it happen, there are things we can do to prepare ourselves when revival does happen. It's like how we can't control the wind, but we can align our sails so that when the wind does blow, we're ready to move. It's like uh, how we can't make ourselves fall asleep, but there are things that we can do to facilitate sleep. We can take a warm shower, we can turn out the lights, we can power down our devices before going to bed, set the temperature slightly lower, so on and so forth. You can't say, go to sleep and fall asleep, but you can certainly do things that facilitate sleep. And in the same way, only God can bring revival, but there are things that we can do to facilitate it, to be prepared when revival does come. So just what are those things? What are these things that facilitate catching fire? The first, I would say, is the preaching of God's word. Prerequisite number one of revival, the preaching of the word of God. Read verse three with me. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah now obeys the Lord. He goes to Nineveh. You have to wonder, what must have been going through his mind? What must have been in his heart? Was it feelings of anxiety? Was it fear? After all, you knew that Jonah was going into hostile territory. The level of hostility here is not just like wearing a Yankees cap up in Boston. Experts in the book of Jonah have likened it to maybe like a Jewish rabbi uh, preaching on the streets of Berlin right before World War II, or an African American going into the Deep South uh, right as the Civil War was beginning. So for Jonah to have this mixture of fear and anxiety, it's very likely, but we're not given any indication of that from the text. But what we do know definitively was that there was this anger, there was this hatred in his heart as he preached. All this was because Nineveh was Israel's mortal enemies. We'll get more into that next week, but whatever emotions resided within Jonah, he obeys. He brings God's word to them. The text says, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Archaeological digs have uncovered uh, what is believed to be Nineveh. It's located in the modern-day city of uh, Mosul, the outskirts of that. From those digs, they discovered that Nineveh had, uh, had these walls around it about uh, eight miles out. And for those of us who, who are paying attention, we recognize that you know, it should not have taken three days' journey to go through eight miles. But before we think that this is an exaggeration, consider New York City. If we think about Manhattan proper, we know that it's about 13 miles long, two and a half miles wide. It's big, but not huge. But then we start to think about the, the f four boroughs outside of Manhattan, and we start to realize it's much bigger. If we consider the greater metro area, it's huge. And in the same way, that seems to be happening here. What's being described is Nineveh city proper plus all the surrounding areas. But then let's move on. Read with me, verse 4. Jonah began going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Jonah walks right into the heart of the city and begins preaching the word of God, a word of judgment on them. 
for those of you who like short sermons, you will like this one because this is one of the shortest sermons ever recorded. It's only eight words long. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. <laughs> I can't make a match. Trust me, it's eight. I counted before. I'm pretty sure he preached that with no notes. Sometimes we see this as nothing but judgment as we look at this message. But unpack these hard words and let's see if there's more to it. Now, Jonah begins his sermon with 40 more days. If you've read the Bible for any significant amount of time, you'll recognize that 40 is a significant number. 40 days, 40 nights was the amount of time it took for the rains to drown uh, the enemies of God in Noah's day. 40 years was how long the Israelites wandered in the wilderness after they had disobeyed in the time of Moses. 40 lashes with the whip was God's ordained penalty for a guilty person sentenced to a beating. 40 days, in other words, means that God is not messing around. He means business here. Eugene Peterson says this, though. Quote, 40 is a stock biblical word that has hope at its core. 40 days is a period of testing the reality of one's life, examining it for truth for authenticity. More than that, um, Jonah continues on and says, Nineveh will be overthrown. The Hebrew ear would hear this word and know that there are two distinct meanings uh, to the word hapak. This word was probably one of the greatest uses, usages of irony in the book of Jonah. When Jonah said that Nineveh would be overthrown, no doubt in his mind he meant overthrown in the way of Sodom and Gomorrah, completely destroyed, overturned. The word hapik is used like this in Genesis 19, and we know what happened there. So Jonah was excited about going into the heart of the enemy and saying, God's going to get you. You're going to be overthrown. However, there's this other meaning to the word hapik. It's also used in Exodus 7, verse 15, when Moses has his staff changed. The staff happened into a snake. The water of the Nile happened to blood. In Hosea 18, happened is used to describe the change in God's heart. So this seems to be this, this incredible irony in our story because Jonah walks into Nineveh hoping that God is going to happen, destroy the city. But what ultimately happens was that Nineveh happened. Nineveh was the thing that changed. Notice what happens after Jonah's wonderful short sermon was given to the people of Nineveh. Verse 5. The Ninevites believe God. The Ninevites believe God. So this remarkable thing happens here. God's word does not return void. It didn't fall on deaf ears. The people of Nineveh heard God's word, and they responded by being changed. And two truths immediately come to mind. First, there's a saying that goes, hard words make soft people. Hard words make soft people. The most kind thing anyone can do for another person is to speak the truth in love. Maybe not a lot of love in Jonah's heart, but at least the truth part was there here. Anyone who is a mother will tell you if they see their child doing something dangerous, they will jump in instinctively with warnings and threats. So uh, this past week, my, my kids have been playing with this like exercise ball. You know those big exercise balls? So my, my kids decided that it'd be pretty cool if they would uh, try to balance themselves with no arms, no legs, nothing touching but their butts, right? So they're, they're on this ball, and then in the middle of it, um, my son CJ just kind of like goes tumbling backwards. His head just barely misses the, uh, uh, the armoire, whatever you call that thing, right? The wood thing. And um, at... At that point, my wife sees it, and Mama Bear comes out, and she shuts it down like they had started this like dog fighting ring or something. And she starts yelling, and then, and I may or may not have even gotten yelled at too. <laughs> I was just holding the stopwatch. That's all I was doing. But it makes sense. You see a person putting themselves in danger, you need to warn them and put an end to it. Now, I'm a pretty sensitive person by nature both in receiving feedback and giving feedback. And maybe you are as well. But this is what we need to hear here. 
We need to hear this word because hard words make soft hearts. Conversely, soft words make hard hearts. Sometimes a gracious word of rebuke is the most loving thing we can do for a person. If you see uh, someone heading in the wrong way, but you encourage them to keep going the wrong way simply by not saying anything or watering the truth down so much that the real message is not received, then you really don't love the other person. And likewise, there's a real sense in which the message of Jesus Christ for sinners is not received as a message of hope in our society. The solution is not to water down the message as if there was no such thing as sin. The solution is to proclaim it truthfully, honestly, in a manner that's gracious, loving, and uh, with integrity. It's only through a faithful witness that people may be saved. Hard words make soft hearts. Second truth apparent from this passage is the power inherent in God's word. The power of Jonah's message was in the spirit at work in the hearts of the people. It was not in the beauty of his words or the persuasiveness of the messenger. It's the word itself that's powerful. Paul says in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. If we want to see revival in our great city, in New York and beyond, what we need in our day are men and women, people who faithfully proclaim the truth of God's word. We need Christians who believe in the power of God to work, not because of their skill, not because of their persuasiveness, not because of their charisma, but with the dependence on the crucified Christ. Because how can we believe in the one of whom they have not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? And that is why the first prerequisite of revival is the preaching of God's word. The second prerequisite of revival is confession of sin. Verses 5 and 6. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne and took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. And this becomes this turning point. Nineveh was great in his sinfulness, and now it's great in his confession. From the lowest peasant to the king himself, they all recognize their sin. They humble themselves before God. One commentator said this, it was the pagan king who heard the word of the Lord, and without prompting, stood up. He arose from his throne. It is an act of seriousness. By taking off his royal robes, he demonstrated an act of submission. In covering himself with sackcloth, he asked for repentance. Then he sat in the dust, symbolizing hopelessness. And in that moment of clarity, the Ninevites saw what they were. When confronted with this imminence of the end, the veneer of success that they had, the power, the accomplishment, all of that was stripped away. And they saw what they were, naked and poor. Nineveh is a lot like New York. Ninevites are a lot like New Yorkers. From a distance, we see the grandeur of the skyscrapers, the stylishness of the clothing, the people who seem soaked together. But when the accoutrements of life are stripped away, apart from Christ, we all simply stand naked and poor in need of him. Confession is simply admitting that you are wrong. It's admitting uh, and agreeing with God, acknowledging sin as sin before the Lord. The hard thing about confession is, quite frankly, no one likes to be wrong, much less have to admit that we were wrong. What gets in the way of confession is our pride. Naturally, on our own, we will do anything to rationalize, to justify the blame shift 
in order to not have to admit that we're at fault. But without confession of sin, there can be no revival. Sin separates us from God. Ninevites respond to God's word, and they're humble. They're broken. They bow down low. They put on clothing of mourning. Now they approach the Lord with contrition. But they don't just confess their sin. There's this real discernible turning around, and it leads us to the third prereq of revival, repentance. Verses 7 to 9. This is the proclamation he, the king, issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. This is one of the great recorded events of a nation turning to God in repentance. It's decisive, it is drastic. In the Bible, there are warnings about a kind of sorrow that is worldly and not godly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is that kind of sorrow that isn't sorry. Worldly sorrow is that kind of sorrow that simply says, I'm sorry I got caught, not because they're sorry in how they acted. It's the kind of sorry that blames anybody and everybody. It's the kind of sorrow that doesn't take ownership for what has happened. And all of that is a false repentance. But here's how we know what happened in Nineveh was this godly sorrow, how it was evidence of true repentance. From verses 7 to 9, we see four things. They fast, they cover themselves in sackcloth, they call on God in prayer, they turn from their wicked ways. It's not a superficial apology. It's deep. It's real. And we see that even while the king of Nineveh responded appropriately, the citizens didn't wait for him before they acted. They went and acted on their own. They didn't go around blaming each other for the calamity that was at their doorstep. Instead, each person from top to bottom took ownership for their role in the collective wickedness. And this is probably one of the hard things in our time. Perhaps it's probably the most troubling thing in our day. Everybody blames everybody else. Everything around us is at fault except for ourselves. Our fingers are pointed every which way except once again at ourselves. Until there's this stopping of the blame shifting, there is no godly sorrow. That's what's wrong right now. When there's no godly sorrow, there's no repentance. When there's no repentance, there's no healing. And when there's no healing, there's no revival. To show the extent of their desire to turn around, to show their desire to be reconciled to God, even the animals are included in the fasting. Some of you may wonder, how do animals get included in the fasting? It's really easy. You just stop feeding them. This is, this is a an involuntary fasting for the animals. But before we consider this an act of great cruelty and unfairness, there is this uh, real biblical understanding here that humans and animals alike have a common creator. More than that, if we think about it, the destruction that was destined for Nineveh in 40 days, it wasn't just targeting people. It was targeting the entire city. One person said it like this, Without God's intervention, the cattle and sheep and goats will all die in 40 days, just as the men and women and children will. Moreover, in depriving the animals, the king would actually have in mind its effect on the people. Seeing and hearing an afflicted ox or lamb or goat, its human caretakers would be reminded of what grievous and severe punishment they were worthy in as much as innocent animals suffered punishment together with them. And when you look at the Ninevites, there's this great change that takes place. We know that the repentance is real because it wasn't only a turning away from disobedience, but also a turning towards obedience. As the king himself announced, let them give up their evil ways and their violence. And this led to this great revival and to our last point, the results of revival, which is transformation of lives and of society. Verse 10. 
When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. How we know that the repentance was not a flash in a pan, but a genuine act of contrition and a commitment to restitution is because God saw what they did. God saw it. It's fairly easy for people to hide their genuine motives, their secret thoughts from other people, but no one can hide their true feelings from God. God knows our hearts even than, better than we know ourselves. But in this moment of time, God saw the Ninevites, how they turned from their evil ways. He discerned that it was real, that it was a genuine repentance. And what's amazing here is how we witness here not only this personal inward transformation taking place in the hearts of individuals as they cried out to the Lord, but we also see this outward transformation of an entire community of a society leaving its wicked ways. What we see is not only personal conversion, but social reform. So a lot of times when people approach this passage of Jonah, they'll either see it in light of personal salvation or they'll see it in terms of social justice. And likewise, in our day, Bible-believing Christians will also will often shy away from uh, social justice issues because they don't want to be accused of promoting some sort of social gospel and leaving the truth of the gospel. But nothing could be further from the truth. I think what happens uh, quite often is we can create this false dichotomy that's not actually there. We don't have to choose whether we're gonna preach the gospel for personal salvation or engage in social justice. God calls us to both and. We're to preach the gospel and involve ourselves in social justice. Yes, the primary role of the church is to preach the gospel, but it is the job of every single Christian to also love our neighbor. Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. Social justice is nothing more, nothing less than loving our neighbor. As we, see, uh, as we seek the good of the great city of New York and beyond, what we need desperately is both to preach the good news and to love our neighbor, seeking both personal transformation and the transformation of our city. When I was a seminarian up in uh, Boston, I went to a church and, uh, you know, in Boston, it's crazy. I feel like everybody has a PhD, everybody's super bright. And I remember when I first came to the church, uh, there was a professor from MIT. He introduced himself and he said, uh, I know more about waves than any person on, on the planet. I was like, what kind of, did you just tell me you have no friends? What? <laughs> what a weird way to introduce yourself, right? <laughs> but then, uh, uh, the, what was surprising to me was the person that had the most impact in that church was actually a, a car mechanic with no degrees at all. He discerned the, the move of God in his life. He sold his business. He joined a missions agency, and they sent him to this place uh, called the Wa Sovereign Nation. You probably have never heard of the Wa Sovereign Nation. I didn't either. It's actually in the Golden Triangle. Golden Triangle is called the Golden Triangle because it's right near uh, Myanmar, was Thailand, and thank you. Yeah, it's Laos, right? Okay. And if you know anything about the Golden Triangle, it's famous for one thing, and that is drugs. It was, it was a uh, community that, that had grown it and sold um, opium for the cartels. And when he went there, he preached the gospel. But he didn't stop at preaching the gospel. What also happened as people turned to Christ was he recognized that these were poor farmers. They actually were not getting rich off of drug money at all. They were growing poppy because they, they knew nothing else to grow. So he brought in experts, others who were, who were experts in agriculture. They taught them to grow a tea that could be sold in Taiwan. And it was amazing because the tea was worth far more to them than the, the poppy that became opium. And from that, the whole region was revitalized. Uh, people were turning to the Lord in droves. At one point, he baptized so many people in the river that he got uh, pneumonia. Now, I look at this and I realize that 
God is at work in our day. Maybe you don't imagine this happening in our city. But I believe that God has more for our city than what we see right now. God has more for each of us. I heard it said once like this. Sometimes when, when you, you're praying and you're hoping for a revival and you're living out your life in such a way you don't see anything happen, it, it's not as if nothing is happening. But maybe it's more like how when, back in the day when people use uh, vending machines, you put in quarters, right? And nothing would happen. Nothing would happen until you reach the amount. And then the food would come, snacks or drinks or whatever it is, would just come tumbling down. And in a similar way, maybe now, you don't see much happening in our city. It seems like there's a lethargy or, or a lack of interest in Jesus Christ. But I believe that God wants so much more for our city, for each of us. And for us, what we need to do personally on our own end is to embody and live out this through confession, repentance, being bold in, in our word, being bold in loving our neighbors. We only got one life, but God can use it if we're willing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for your word in Jonah chapter 3, how we see even the most wicked can turn around. And we hope and we pray and, and we desperately seek the good and the revival of New York City and beyond. We pray that you would use us. We pray that we would live such lives that there would be a consistency and integrity there that it would not, uh, it would not be, be a hindrance to the gospel, rather it would be one that promotes the gospel. Help us to be bold when opportunities come to tell of the work that you have done in our lives. Help us also to love our neighbors and, as we love ourselves so that as we work towards the social reform and, and the good of our city, many would come to draw near to you and we would see a tremendous change in our lifetimes. We pray in your great name, amen.
Good morning, church. It's wonderful to be able to share some announcements with you, but first, um, if you are visiting for the first time or if you're watching at home, a special welcome to you. Um, let's take the moment just right now just to wave to each other uh, just where you're at. Um, just a couple announcements for, for you this morning. Uh, next Sunday, we will have our annual meeting. We will hear a report on the budget, and we'll get an update on the building. Um, so if you're a member, you'll want to be there for that. Um, if you plan to join us via Zoom, um, register online by uh, Tuesday, um, and then the, the link for that meeting will be uh, emailed out on Friday. Uh, from Mei Ling. Um, next, uh, or two weeks from now, our fourth of five modules will begin for our discipleship uh, group, and the details for that are on the back of the bulletin. Um, last week, we voted on the co workers for the English congregation, and these are the results. Uh, the following candidates were elected as English co workers for 2021. Anthony Iliacostas Jr., Carol Tom, Drew Durant, Ebert Mahone, Harry Washington, Jenny Lau, Joseph Cena, Melody Ting, Nicole Yuen, Tabitha Williams Brown, and Yvette Ramirez. Uh, offering receipts will be made available um, at the end of the month. And so if you donated over $250 over the course of 2020, you'll be receiving. Um, your receipt at the email that we have for the weekly email updates. And then finally, um, if you have a numbered envelope, it can be picked up in the offering in the lobby after the service. Um, now we arrive at, our, at the time in our service where we take up our offering. Um, as, you, as you know, if you want to give an offering, you can either give it here this morning or in person during the week or online. Let's pray for the offering. God, you are good, and your mercy endures forever. God, we, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather um, as your people. And this morning, we take time out of our service to give back to you what you've given to us. Help us to appreciate um, what we have. Help us to be thankful, and help us to, in faith, give to you uh, what you've given to us so that you can advance your kingdom. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to be a, be a beacon in this community. In your name we pray. Amen. Now I'd like to invite Joy up to share a missions moment with us. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's actually... <laughs> exactly noon, so <laughs> I guess it's still morning. Um, the focus of this month's uh, missions moment is our missionaries William and Ruth Evaristo, who work among uh, indigenous uh, Quechua people in Peru. They have three children, Abigail, Andres, and Esteban. They've been serving with Missions Door uh, since 2013 in the Lima metropolitan area of um, Ventanilla, Callao. Pastor Evarista started a church in this community uh, where over 20 families attend service. This is a poor area where people have no running water and their homes are often made of cardboard and rubble. Pastor Evarista and his wife Ruth have also started many service projects in the community, such as medical clinics. You recall um, about two years ago, Carlos um, Catecaro and his wife, Hiromi, uh, went on a, a missions, uh, short-term missions uh, medical trip there. And also Pastor um, John Wine has also uh, been there. In truth, many lives have been changed through the sharing of the gospel. 
So for those of you who are not aware of exactly where Peru is, I just thought I'd give you a little introduction and a little background to the country. So Peru is located in uh, the western part of South America, between Chile to the south and Ecuador and Colombia to the north. It has three official languages, Spanish, Quechua, and Aymara. It's known for the uh, famous alpalca and some alpaca, sorry, and some people have, you know, coats and scarves and everything made from the alpaca. And uh, it's also the home of the famous uh, Machu Picchu ruins. And did you know the humble potato originated there with the Incas? And today, 4,000 uh, different varieties are grown. At the same time, Peru is recovering from more than two decades of civil conflict and violence that began in 1980. Pockets of extreme poverty persist, and many workers have a hard time finding permanent jobs. Many of the Quechua young people that the Evaristos uh, minister to have been exposed to violence in their homes. Consequently, um, the Evaristos have designed a course called Happy, a happy home. It's designed to reach the youth in the community and to educate them about God's plan for a happy home. This has impact not only on the youth themselves, but on their parents as well when they see the change in the behavior of their children. Some thought that having a happy home was next to impossible, but now they know that God is the God of impossibilities. The Evaristos ministry also includes evangelistic campaigns, discipleship, children's ministry, man marriage conferences, retreats, and English classes. Ruth Evaristo, uh, she runs the English classes, and she provides this provides an avenue to reach new people and provide an improvement in their daily lives. Uh, the couple conducts marriage conferences in neighboring towns where 2000, recently 2,100 uh, people attended and where the, um, the Holy Spirit moved in the lives of families by restoring relationships and healing wounds. It was a blessing to see families commit to respect and tolerate each, each other in love and, and, and respect. In May last year, after one of the evangelist, evangelistic campaigns, 30 people accepted the Lord and nine people were baptized. So how has the pandemic uh, touched uh, Peru or in the ministry? Uh, it's, it provided a, an opportunity for them. In, in March of last year, just at the beginning of the pandemic, God allowed the Evaristos to continue sharing the gospel despite the isolation and state of emergency in which they found themselves. They were the only people who had a basic multifunction printer. So since school classes were suspended all last year, they supported families by printing materials for the virtual classes. It was a good opportunity to share the gospel and, and to encourage people. At the same time, as a church, they were able to help with food for 32 families of extreme poverty and the most vulnerable. The ministry in Nanjuña. You, in this slide, you'll see, um, and the slide to come, you'll see photos of the recent visit of the Evaristas in December to a poor community of Nanjuña. Nanjuña, where, which is located 10 hours away from uh, the city of Cusco. They were able to minister to this indigenous community by giving away toys to the children and by providing a Christmas dinner for them. Transportation to this mountainous area is limited. Buses leave only on Monday nights and return to Cusco on Thursdays. However, the Evarisas think the trip is worthwhile. Since Christmas, they've been making many trips to this community with the goal of conducting training workshops for Sunday school teachers and to help children by providing two pairs of thick socks and shoes. For what reason, do you ask? Well, Nanjuña experiences the coldest weather every year in March. The snow level rises to 30 centimeters, which is about a, a foot high. And 
the children are the most vulnerable during the winter. They wear sandals with the indigenous name called Yankees. So due to the exposure to extreme cold, the skin of the children's feet take on a purple and dark color and actually split open. So the Evaristas are in, uh, launching a campaign hoping to provide socks for 400 children between the ages of five and 10. They've indicated that a pair of socks for each child costs $3 and $25 for shoes. So if you'd like to adopt a child from this poor community, you can make a donation to the mission store for this purpose and indicate for the children of, of Nanhuinia. How can you pray for um, the Evaristos? So they have just this one printer, right? And you know, if you keep printing, you, you have to um, maybe get a new printer or get new supplies. So we just pray that God would provide actually a new printer to help with the materials for the virtual classes uh, since schools are still closed. Uh, pray for healing of, ch of families who attend the family uh, conferences. Pray for the community of, of Nyanhuinya that the Lord would provide for all their needs and that they would come to know the Lord as their Lord and uh, as as their Lord and Savior. We thank you for your support, and we thank you for your prayers, and we just pray that um, this sharing and this update will bring to your attention the needs of uh, our missionaries in this area, and to perhaps God will move in your heart to um, support them in, in some way. Thank you very much for your attention. Please stand for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine up on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>